seminar this evening. I appreciate you taking the time and joining me and talking about fishing as a universal language to promote conservation relevancy. I wanted to take a moment to thank Jessica Jordan Page for inviting me to the talk and thanks to Julia for setting up and meeting with me uh, on Wednesday to, to practice. So greatly appreciate that. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am um, Uh, my my name is Kevin Dockendorf. Uh, I, I grew up in uh, New Hampton, Iowa, a uh, small town in northeast part of that state, and uh, grew up fishing. And uh, just the, the picture here is of a, of a carp I'm holding from one of my favorite fishing spots uh, in House Park in uh, North Washington. And uh, I'm an Iowan who loves to fish and practice fish fishing and aquatic science in an ecological framework. I had no idea what that meant when I was a kid, but really that's how I've grown up and I've learned and I, I love to hold fish and, and um, t talk about fishing. Um, most, most important person in my life as far as fishing goes and that start was my grandpa, Virgil Peters. Um, here he and I are holding some northern that we, we caught from a local river and uh, he's really the one that uh, got me started, got me hooked, as they say, and um, really uh, encouraged me uh, throughout my life growing up. In high school, though, um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I never really knew what fisheries and wildlife biology was um, until my junior year in high school when I met my guidance counselor. Uh, Larry Fain, and uh, he talked to me about this uh, career, uh, the availability of it at Iowa State University, and I really had no idea. And I read the article, I read the two-page brochure, and uh, I really absolutely fell in love with those opportunities, where it said someone, uh, this career is for someone who enjoys the outdoors, has grown up fishing, and has an aptitude for science. So I thought that fit me pretty well. Some of the some of the other opportunities in that brochure I wasn't sure about, um, but I certainly uh, uh, enjoyed thinking about the the concept to be paid uh, to go fishing. As I progressed through my time at Iowa State, I, I still realized that I really it was really what I was meant to do. Um, however, some of the challenges of moving and finding a, a, an actual job in this highly competitive career, uh, even back then, uh, was, was a challenge um, to navigate. And um, I know it still remains uh, a highly competitive field. And just encourage those that are interested in it or continue to think that they might be able to uh, obtain a job in this career, keep living your dreams and it's it's a great opportunity but a small town boy from iowa um it took me uh, a few years to find and navigate my way through uh undergrad at, at iowa um in, in uh, iowa state university in ames um, i started also after i graduated started with the iowa department of natural resources with fisheries technician positions um, and uh, spent a lot of time on reservoirs and uh, conducting creel surveys as a technician. And at Spirit Lake, um, I actually drove a snowmobile to interview anglers um, that were ice fishing. And uh, so this, those opportunities uh, were my formative years and uh, checking in on fishing. Um, my time spent at Iowa DNR um, really was mostly part-time and the full-time positions really weren't there. And so I moved to Illinois, worked for the Illinois Natural History Survey, um, worked there for two years. Then I worked to, went to Charlotte AFS meeting, American Fishery Society meeting, and met Mike Allen, who was a professor at University of Florida. And he had a job opening for a graduate assistantship there, working with uh, black crappie, 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 um, speckled perch, uh, probably refer to those 
uh, three names throughout. So you'll know all of my uh, locations through the great states of Iowa, Illinois, and Florida, and North Carolina. Um, ended up in Elizabeth City, and my my career to date, um, I was hired uh, January 2nd of 2003. I started out as a fisheries biologist after receiving my master's degree at University of Florida, promoted to district fisheries biologist, and spent in that role uh, for about six years and then uh, promoted to the Coastal Region Fisheries Research Coordinator in the role that I am now. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I do want to recognize the uh, Sport Fish Restoration uh, funding. It's a, a federal aid in sport fish restoration projects. Um, one theme that I do want to try to make folks aware is how that funding is important to all that we do with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and the Division of Inland Fisheries. Um, it's the primary primary way that we're able to uh, receive funds that we match with state funds. So for uh, every five dollars, uh, four dollars comes from the, uh, the, the uh, federal aid funds and a dollar from the state. So it's a really great uh, matching program, and it's funded through the purchase of fishing equipment, mo motorboat fuels, uh, and, and the like. So that excise tax is already a part of any fishing gear that, that you purchase within the state that you purchase it from, and that money then is earmarked to go back to that state uh, for fishing um, research and restoration. A little bit about the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission is an it is a state agency um, that is is uh, made up of about 660 staff. Uh, we have uh, many divisions and offices uh, in in our agency. The Wildlife Resources Commission was established in 1947 um, after uh, through through the general legislature, but obviously there was work being done in fisheries and wildlife prior to that time. I'm a big history buff. I'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment uh, as it pertains to fishing, but wanted to highlight the mission of the Wildlife Resources Commission as to conserve North Carolina's wildlife resources and their habitats and provide programs and opportunities that allow hunters, anglers, boaters, and other in outdoor enthusiasts to enjoy wildlife associated recreation. And, and to narrow that in, I, I placed a diamond around the Inland Fisheries Division where to highlight the specific work that we do within the agency as managing, conserving, enhancing, and restoring the freshwater public trust aquatic resources of the state of North Carolina. And I'm not the only one um, associated here. I do have great team out in throughout the state of North Carolina. Uh, we make up about uh, 80 uh, staff members from management and research uh, to our fish hatcheries, uh, to our to our supervisors and our administrators within the Raleigh office. There's nine districts associated with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Our districts in the coastal region are districts one, two, and four. And for those of you that are joining from Wake County, you would be considered in district three. Um, for those of you, and that would also be the Piedmont region. So district three, five, and six are the Piedmont. And District 7, 8, and 9 are within the mountains. I do want to recognize the signage I placed up there as to the inland and coastal waters uh, going to the upper area and then coastal to the to the coast. And that's our sister agency, Division of Marine Fisheries, that handle much of the coastal waters. And we, we work in cooperation with Marine Fisheries Division. Um, I'll be, be glad to talk about that later if anyone has questions about that partnership and collaborations. I'm going to focus mostly on freshwater resident fish today in the coastal region. So as I mentioned, we've got the mountains, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain. The coastal plain is where our, all of our coastal fisheries research is conducted. And um, I also placed a, a, a graphic of all the waterways throughout the state of North Carolina. I'm not sure what your favorite water body is. Um, but I'll be glad to, to listen to that and wonder if maybe we've caught fish there from that same water body at some time, or if I've sampled it, maybe you've caught them. I um, also want to note that the rivers in coastal North Carolina 
are are quite um, unique in that they're indicated as swamp waters in the surface water classification. But I think that often is a is a challenge to envision how diverse of a fish assemblage that these waters can actually support. Swamp waters are unique in that they'll they rarely get above five milligrams per liter. And yet we still have great fish assemblages and aquatic habitats here in the coastal plain. And as it pertains to freshwater and brackish brackish fish. It's a challenge for these these fish in freshwater as it it can be brackish. Uh, and it also can have elevated salinities. You'll note in my background, that's a picture of uh, the, the um, Alligator River. And um, the Alligator River is in the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula. And you can see some of the trees in the background. I think there was someone that was doing studies on ghost forests and identifying saltwater intrusion into some of our uh, coastal areas. So that that's some of that uh, backdrop of some of the challenges that even the fish populations here deal with, but I find them to be highly, highly resilient and highly diverse. So my focus is on the coastal freshwater resident fisheries, primarily largemouth bass, catfish, crappie, and sunfish. However, we do have other fish species, and I picked out a, a couple here from large to small. We have bowfin and lognose gar as far as our prehistoric fishes that really do well in these swamp waters and even the black banded sunfish and other fishery fish that we have here in the coastal plain that just make it a very unique and special place i just placed this slide up to highlight the venn diagram of fisheries management the organisms the environment and the people and one thing I take away from this, these three circles is that, yes, those three interact, but that those circles are somewhat static in that image. And what I've learned over time is that those those circles ebb and flow and their sizes are different based on our knowledge of that or how important uh, people see a particular organism or the environment. Um, or maybe we don't know very much about any of those circles, so maybe they're a smaller circle. So I did just want to highlight that fisheries management component, but many of you that are in science and ecologies and the studies, those, all the ology sciences are likely familiar with the Venn diagram of, of the three components of environmental sciences. In fisheries, we are managing objectives, the, the long version, we conduct independent and dependent sur fishery surveys to investigate the population dynamics, the, the, the mortality rates, the recruitment rates, uh, the growth, growth rates that achieve yield. And we develop and utilize those, that information for quality fisheries for anglers that seek recreational important fish species. So by independent, is the gears we utilize to sample those fish populations. In the coastal plain, one primary gear we utilize is boat electrofishing. And boat electrofishing is, utilizes electric current to stun the fish and attract them to the, to the uh, booms on the front of the boat. The bottom of the boat is the paint is actually scraped off and the, is, it is the, exposes the, the metal hull of the aluminum boat. And that's actually a cathode. So we have, basically have a big battery in the water, yes, mixing electricity and water, that, that is something that we do. But in all, all safety, uh, using gloves, fiberglass rods, um, everything is taped off and grounded. So we, 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 we consider it as a bird on a wire. If you're familiar with how birds can sit on electrical wire, this is another way that we can safely electrofish and, and sample fish. There's other opportunities for us to use other gears, such as trap nets, um, seines, um, gill nets. We use larval fish traps at night. Um, we've used bongo nets to collect smaller fish. So our goal is to utilize the gears available for us to sample the fish that are out there in independent form. Dependent ways are through angler surveys, where we actually go out and interview anglers to find out what their preferences are for the day of their fishing, what their total catch was, what, what they may have harvested. Of that catch, what did they release? 
we also look, look into the economics of that uh, water body where we ask about how much they spent for uh, bait or ice or food or fuel to get to their location that day to help tell us a little bit more about the anglers that are utilizing those resources. Stocking is also a management tool that we utilize in incorporation with your uh, fishing licenses and those those monies that we do. If any of you are out trout fishing, either to the mountain water uh, for for our for our trout waters, or if you you um, fish for stock trout in the Piedmont region in some of our um, uh, public fishing areas or partnerships that we have, um, you may have seen a stocking truck where we we are utilizing that to provide fishing opportunities. We also use stocking um, when we need to enhance the populations or restore them utilizing native uh, fishes that we cultured in the hatcheries. Um, native aquatic organisms such as mussels and other fish species are also utilized in our, or uh, propagated in our in our fish hatcheries. However, the funding sources for those may be from um, alternative uh, uh, sources. So I, I, I tried to not go too deep into much of the data analysis and showing a bunch of figures and and uh, just just though that it's a it's an intense process of us going out and getting our gear ready and ensuring that we do have the gears necessary to go out, sample these fisheries and and get more information from the anglers so that we can uh, provide better opportunities. The short version. We study fish and habitat so that generations of anglers can continue to fish for years to come. And ultimately, that's our goal is to uh, continue uh, this, this great opportunity of going outside and fishing um, as, as, a, as a wonderful sport. Um, next slide I want to, um, next few slides, I want to highlight a research opportunity that I had looking at um, of largemouth bass populations at Lake Matamesquite. And um, one of the one of the um, outcomes of the creel surveys, we learned that anglers were somewhat concerned about where largemouth bass may have went because their catch rates had fallen back in, compared to previous years. Yet we know that fishing is not catching. So the opportunity for us to go out and learn more about the systems so we can report back to anglers of what might be going on and why, why largemouth bass might not be in their, in, their, in their creel as much. So the project objectives were to surgically implant acoustic tags in largemouth bass. We also would monitor the water levels and other environmental parameters as water quality is such a significant part of these, these fish populations and look to evaluate fine scale movement in relation to locations and habitats. Those methods included having a stationary receiver array out in the water column. We mounted these receivers to PVC moorings and I placed them in canals along, along the lake to find out if I could find if those fish were utilizing lake habitats, the canals, or maybe a little bit of both. And also monitored water quality and quantity. Um, you may be familiar with USGS gauges. Um, those USGS gauges uh, monitor various environmental parameters, um, particularly at, at Lake Matamesquite for lake level, but also dissolved oxygen pH values that we can monitor. Um, we also looked at salinity and temperature and dissolved oxygen to see if there was any trends uh, there. Uh, the fish tagging procedures were to use an, an acquiesce through, a, through an approved project. Um, I actually utilized an, um, an acquiesce to knock these fish out um, and they were under for about five minutes. Um, during that time, I um, had a, a VEMCO tag, which was the acoustic tag, utilizing technology similar to that that they use in submarines, as well as a pit tag so I could quickly identify the fish with use of a, a, a passive in, integrated transponder wand or pit. 
and monitored them for suture and recovery to ensure that they did recover uh, from the surgical event. Um, I'm going to take a moment here to see if the next slide will play. Um, I do not think there's any sound. I'll try to um, uh, narrate uh, what I'm what I'm doing at the time there. So let's see if this works. All right, do we have movement? Can you all see that uh, I have the fish that's been anesthetized. I also have a towel over its head. It's placed upside down in the PVC trough. I placed an incision and there's the Vemco tag. I placed that within the cavity, abdominal cavity of the fish. There's the wand that, I, that I'm using and I have now jumped over to uh, suturing up the fish and uh, placing uh, one suture at that uh, incision point. Again, the fish is still under an, an anesthet being anesthetized. And you can see we collected it with electrofishing. I'm getting a, a length. I'll get a weight on it as well. I'll report that to um, my teammate. Um, and uh, thanks to GoPro <laughs> and making making a quick uh, show there. Um, thank you for viewing that and that research opportunity. Um, whoops, hit the play button. All right. Um, so um, I, I, I'm not sure how much um, um, I can actually split in my time as to what my vocation and my avocation is. Um, it's hard to actually sit here and say that I'm getting paid to do this, but but I but I am. But it's thanks to the anglers to doing this, including myself. To I, I love to go fishing. I I buy fishing rods. I, I, I my neighbors have bought boats. Um, I love to I love to research fish, and uh, I really do enjoy to, love to talk about fishing. Um, I think about. Um, the communications of when I go uh, when I go to other places outside of someone that's fishing, and I can think about two uh, quick examples. Uh, my barber, and um, it was a really uh, challenging conversation. Just had just had met him, and and uh, we started talking, and there really wasn't much to talk about, and so he happened to say something about fishing, and I said, "Oh yeah, I love fishing." He's like, "You do? That's great." And uh, he's, I think he actually stopped concentrating my hair to take his phone out and show me all the pictures of him fishing. I'm not sure if my hair ever recovered from that, but that's probably a little bit of genetics working that too. Another example was recently when we bought a, a, a mattress from Mattress Firm. And um, um, I really wasn't uh, talking too much about what I did. I was just wanting to get into the mattress firm and get back out. But the salesperson was really, really friendly. And my wife introduced me as someone that fished and it completely changed the conversation. And uh, I believe we got a hundred dollar discount because we talked about fishing. But that's how I say it. Um, I, I placed this slide in here just to kind of take some time. And really, when I was thinking about fishing and the, the comment about the um, fishing as a universal language or that it is a universal language. I wondered how much that really had um, been stated before. So through research, I, I backed up a little bit and I went back to um, a, a, a person from the, the from old England, um, Isaac Walton. Some of you may uh, know of Isaac Walton through the Isaac, Isaac Walton League. Um, he was a, a very prominent person in the, in the English realm. Uh, he lived from uh, 1593 to 1683. In 1653, he wrote The Complete Angler. And um, it, was, it was quite a story of, of a conversation betwixt an angler, a hunter, and a falconer contemplating their chosen sports as well as their water, earth, and air respectively, as to where their quarry was found. And 
the complete angler has been around for 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 quite some time and one of the art one of the same statements in there that um the angler or piscator was the name of the um character um you know spent a lot of time highlighting the importance of angling and seemed to really have outweighed his hunters and falconer friends but his his hunters and his falconer friends were quite uh helpful in sharing their own stories so i, I thought it was quite interesting that we all have our own backgrounds and we all con converse about what we love and 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 understand and it's important to have that communication but piscator the angler communicated indeed my friend you will find angling to be like be like the virtue of humility which has a calmness of spirit and a world of other blessings attending upon it and that was quite a step back i'm sure there's other 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 uh, uh stories written between between uh then and now about fishing uh it's just quite interesting that isaac walton's uh complete angler has has stood the literal test of time Moving into um, the fishes of North Carolina that was uh, written by Hugh, um, Hugh Smith in 1907. Um, in, in that time period, North Carolina uh, was mostly looked at, um, with the geological survey um, through the geological um, survey. And uh, the state geologist at the time was Joseph Pratt. And apparently there was a lot of questions about fish and fishing at the time in North Carolina. And he mentioned that it is hoped that this volume will be the means of creating such an interest in the fisheries that suitable laws for their protection may be enacted as needed and that the state officers charged with administration of the fisheries may have the sympathy and cooperation of all citizens. And I think that's, that's quite uh, uh, telling about the public trust and how important our state aquatic resources are and actually nation aquatic uh, resources. Uh, jumping ahead and, and jumping ahead in time, but a little bit back to my Iowa roots. This was a this was a, a book from uh, 1956. Um, it was uh, um, similar to the fishes of, of many states where they'll highlight those species and where they're found and, and really quite fascinating when it comes to uh, knowing the historic ranges of fish and especially when stocking also is has at the time was was pretty prevalent um, so it, it's really quite fascinating that these books exist but what i found interesting in the actual chapter about angling that really resonated with me and in, in, in for tonight's talk and really for what i do um, angling might well be considered the universal sport since its followers come from all walks of life and from all parts of the world, neither wealth, position, creed, age, nor sex serves to eliminate anyone from participation in this healthful and relaxing recreation. And I just thought that that has just such deep uh, resonation with me and and in, in what I do. Um, not sure how many of you are gun smoke fans. But uh, I've I've uh, uh, come into watching it on the Inspiration Channel, and um, there was an episode called uh, Miss Kitty, aired in originally aired in 1961, and uh, Miss Kitty was um, had a had a had a, a child that came in on a stagecoach, and it had the town all abuzz about who this child could be, but in the episode in this image they are talking about some pretty significant components about that particular episode. And I found it interesting that fishing was a part of how to talk about a very challenging topic um, where with this child not really knowing who his uh, mother was or father was and coming across the lands at that time, but of course written for that. But I felt, I felt it kind of interesting that they utilize fishing uh, in, in that in that aspect. And and in today's world of the blogs and and and, and obviously during the pandemic, 
um, we, we did see a record amount of angling opportunities for people to be outside. And I found a blog from the Morning Moss blog from June 15th, 2020, written by Badger Sportsman. No idea who Badger Sportsman is. I can think about many things, perhaps from Wisconsin, someone that likes badgers. Not sure, but the, the, the sediments here in their quote um, speaks volumes. Fishing is a universal language. It's primal and calming. It's the best stress reliever and the antidote to an overcomplicated world. And I really think that this, this component highlights to me how I do go back to fishing when things get a little bit out of hand or pressures and stressors come into my life that I'm really not sure how to navigate. And these are my two children, Aaron on, on uh, the left and Sydney on the right. And when we took them for a fish for fun event that was hosted here where we had stocked catfish into the pond and being able to look over their shoulders and see the bobbers and perhaps a, a, a beautiful day to, to help calm whatever, whatever might be going on, which highlights my aspects about using fishing for insights to conservation relevancy. And as I thought about the topic and, and, and worked with Jessica and Julia about what to present, you know, it, it seems that there's challenges that exist throughout every profession um, and, and, and conservation is no different. Um, some of the take home pieces that I, I do think about are in relation to awareness of a situation or an issue and that we actively listen to that and apply what we know and learn from others, um, especially in conservation, patience and perseverance to those issues that is a challenge sometimes when this um, in, in automatic need for instantaneous gratification and that we know that mother nature is patient in her time and 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 that we we learn from our investigations and observations uh, to then provide interpretations and interventions that may may be uh, helpful. We can't do it alone. We need allies and partners to uh, converse about this and ensure that conservation does remain relevant. But I believe that it is a is an important part. It's 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 in our blood. Um, where it's uh, all of it is is a is a big part of of who we are. And to me, I think we recreation is also a component of recreation that when we get out in nature, we do have the opportunity to recreate ourselves and reconnect um, to those things that are so important to our souls and to our to our inner inner beings and, and our communities. Through that seeking common ground and actively seeking it and and working towards those efforts um, are, are so important. And when we cheer success, it drives for further success. And and ultimately, you know, we take a kid fishing, take a kid fishing. It doesn't matter the age from uh, if they're five or six or if they're 90, you know, the, the children are all inside us. We all want to take a part of that. And and I think many of you that are part of this conversation this evening do see that. And um, I, I appreciate that and uh, look forward to working with you all on considering fishing for insight to conservation relevancy. I'd just like to take a moment to, to highlight that opportunity to take a kid fishing during National Fishing and Boating Week coming up in June, June 5th to the 13th, there's opportunities that we work with our partners to get out there and, and bring opportunities for children to, to go fishing at those local ponds. Um, we work with those partners to provide catfish or other, other, uh, other fish that might uh, have, a, have an opportunity to be caught um, and, and bring a smile to a child's face. Whether or not they're harvested, you know, that's another aspect of angling, um, catching and harvesting, but to actually placing that effort and going out is, is really, to me, the, the, the salt of the earth. Um, we, we do offer um, fishing locations, and, and, and uh, Julia, this might be an opportunity here for this, 
community fishing program site for for those sites that are both affiliated and that we we sponsor and support um or they might be locations that um are are opportunities for others to go fishing and some of you on the call might might actually be those partners so so thank you um also like to recognize when you do see signage about protecting your waters that we do have issues regarding aquatic nuisance species, most recently regarding the zebra mussel scare that was occurring in the moss balls in, in many of our aquatic um, uh, aquarist uh, locations. And you know, we really need to work to stop the spread of aquatic nuisance species. Um, it, it's really critical that we do clean, drain and dry and also never move fish, plants, or other organisms from one body to another. And um, th those are those are critical steps, and we, we encourage you to, to support that and, and be advocates for that. And as far as other cha challenges, a universal challenge, you know, of packing it in and packing it out. And while this may have created a habitat for a snail, uh, it's not really nice to see this trash uh, through our through our boat ramps and that type of stuff. So when I'm out on an angler creel survey, I do try to pick up around our boat ramps or wherever I can. Um, I love what I love what we do. It is aquatic resource management, but particularly fisheries management is is near and dear to my heart. And as I said earlier, it's my it's my vocation. It's ab, my avocation. I truly found um, the the of the adage of if you ever um, choose a job that you love you'll never work a day in your life and besides the, the some of the administrative stuff and those types of things of which i think about are the are some of the stressors and challenges of what i get paid to do all of this is is fantastic and i i, I love working um in partnership and in collaboration uh, with students and professionals alike it's really really fascinating and um, with that, I'm gonna, um, uh, I'd like to have the opportunities to chat more about the fishing opportunities to enhance conservation relevancy and to promote that. So feel free to ask live or in the chat and if nothing comes to you tonight, please, uh, you got my email and phone number. So I'd be glad to talk to you more about fishing. Yeah, if y'all have any uh, questions, you can throw it in the chat and I will read it out loud. Otherwise, um, you should see at the top ribbon a microphone that will allow you to unmute yourself and ask a question via your computer microphone if you have that available to you. Jesse, you have a question question hey sorry didn't uh chime in or say hi earlier i uh just i was traveling and i just got to the hotel but i do have a question about um so you have the take a child outdoors um take a child fishing kind of programs but do you have those programs available for adults and what are you guys doing to kind of start that conservation con conversation with adults who may not really get that exposure through programmatic means? Yeah, great question. And um, I, I, I probably could have done a better job about highlighting some of those other opportunities that we do have. I'll, I'll first highlight our, our uh, John Peckman Center Fishing Center in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, Tom Carpenter is the is the director there and uh, primarily has many many types of workshops for adults, beginners, um, through uh, experience. Um, we also have, they also promote kayak fishing and other opportunities there. Um, but, but that being said, we have other um, opportunities to meet and talk with uh, anglers um, when they call. Uh, we also have opportunities to work with pond owners should they want to create a pond so to go fishing um, but i think also to working with partners like city of raleigh i understand you all are having an, an adult fishing workshop so you know those opportunities for us to share messages and and highlight uh, that is also a very critical spot um, also want to shout out to our nc aquariums um, that that promote 
those fish in their aquariums and those opportunities that might be there for for anglers to witness and see our our work um it's really neat to see that when we do go out and we sample fish and we provide them for the aquariums um we see the um displays and they provide information about where they occur whether it's cool water um, cold water for trout um warm water for bass those types of things but i think to keep the conversation going and and to reach more uh communities um and 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 to to try to reach others that we haven't before is 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 important as well but excellent question jesse and I appreciate it. So we got a question in chat. What kind of stock enhancement does North Carolina do? Stock enhancements that we do. OK, so one thing that um, I had in a, um, in the as a as a backup in case we had time. Um, and if it's OK with uh, y'all, I'll, I'll move into that one because I think it it can highlight this stock enhancement. So I um, want to recognize that it's it's the hurricane preparedness season this week, May 9th through the 15th of 2021. And um, if you're from North Carolina, or you're from the Atlantic coast, you're well aware of you're well aware of the season. However, I'll just give these where I'll give you some graphics that our peak times are um, August through September, no, June 1 to November 30th. Um, this is another historic data set, 1851 to 2016. I need to update that. That shows kind of that ebbs and flows. And those hurricane impacts to the aquatic resources include the storm surges that occur when they flood the swamp and they rush that uh, aerobic uh, material, anaerobic material back out to the to the river. Mother Nature really doesn't carry a debt, and so she takes away a lot of the available oxygen to break down that anaerobic. Uh, material and detritus. We also have saltwater intrusion that comes up um, and, and uh, has that salty salty components. Um, and so we, we often have little to no oxygen and at times for days no oxygen. And Isabel 2003 really was an eye opener for me being from Iowa and the Midwest and even from Florida. My two years there in Florida were relatively calm as it for hurricanes, so I really know, I really didn't know much about hurricanes, but I learned about them quickly, and that they will crash that dissolved oxygen for days on end. And of course, there are bowfin and longnose gar that can utilize um, uh, air through their abilities to gasp for air from the surface. But there's many other fish that cannot uh, go uh, without oxygen uh, for very long. So some of that work that we do for stock enhancement, especially in the coastal plain, is in regards to replacement following fish kills that were evolved from the hurricane uh, uh, consequences. So for us, you know, hurricanes are a when not if scenario. We know they will occur. We just don't know to what, what degree. Both Isabel in 2003 and Irene in 2011 provided us with direction. And we communicated with angling groups and others as to what we needed to do, but we couldn't do a stocking right from the start. We didn't have fish in the hatchery. We really didn't know what extent we had an issue. Um, so there are opportunities for us to conduct stock enhancement, but first we want to know what we can do to learn more about where we need to conduct wise, wise use of resources. So we actually do have a hurricane response plan in the event there's fish kills. And we will look at through that through first safety first, that we do live in the coastal plain and our own homes and our access areas and everything else could be affected by those. So we do ensure that our personnel, the equipment, water quality are safe. But, but as when we do get out there, we assess the extent and duration of that hypoxia and those fish kills. So that gives us kind of a sample site. Um, we look at those sites within and adjacent to the areas in the first fall. Then we survey again in the spring, the following spring, to see what adults are out there that can uh, perhaps have recovery on, on its own. Then we survey the juvenile, juvenile fish abundance in the fall. Um, and then we consider our survey options. And if one of those are our management options, 
and what we may have done already is put fish in the hatchery to grow them out to a particular size. And that's one of the ways that we do stock enhancement through through stocking fish after fish kills. But we also try to stock the assemblage. But what we've learned over those those two those two hurricanes and others after that is that with time and opportunity, recovery will likely most occur naturally. But there are instances where we can take the opportunity where it kills, say, flathead catfish, which is an invasive species in the coastal plain. We can utilize that to stock back native white catfish as an opportunity to get the native population back in check. So in the coastal plain, we really focus on uh, re replacement following fish kills and then opportunities to support the native native fisheries. And I didn't talk too much about it, but we do have significant programs in our anadromous fisheries for striped bass, American shad, and uh, river herring uh, as stock enhancements. So, so to answer your question, we do quite a bit, and I probably could have had an entire another talk about uh, those. So, so thank you very much for the question. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I'll ask another. So, um, Kevin, you've been you've been working in this field for quite a while, and so a lot of the conversation is about fishing um, and conservation relevancy. So, have you seen that conversation change as um, you know the numbers of people who are fishing have changed? Are those numbers changing? And you know, what has been your experience with any uh, pushback in conservation work that you do? Clarify if I need to, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, that's a great question, Jessica. And, you know, I think placing that into that time frame that throughout my life, really, I've been fishing all my life and through the through the places that I've been, that, that it seems to me that when the conversation is finding that common ground for fishing, you know, we have the opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into what, what, is, what is the viewpoint about that person's uh, way, of, way of life um, and, and angling. And, and there's, there's so much work being done now to the social sciences of angling you know, that the American Sport Fishing Association has identified seven personas related to fishing and angling. And, and so much so that like an average angler doesn't exist. You know, that, that we've got traditionalists out there that, that might be somebody like me who grew up with it, but we've got the friendly fishermen and anglers. And, and, and you know, and, and even saying that fishermen is intended as gender neutral, but I know that that could even be um, potentially, you know, uh, heard uh, differently, but but I but I mean anglers and fishermen and and watermen are, to me are all gender neutral terms that you know whomever I see out in the water I've I've creeled numerous people and they all have different viewpoints about why I'm asking these questions you know and I remember um, listening to when I was stocking some largemouth bass at Lake Batamesquite I remember an angler like asked me what we were doing. I said, well, we're stocking largemouth bass. He's like, I don't care about largemouth bass. Stock in here some catfish. I'd really love to see some catfish stocked in here. And that was, that was pretty, you know, eye-opening was that largemouth bass was so important. But then again, we didn't necessarily listen or hear from everyone about their needs, which kind of really highlights that, you know, user group and getting that information. Um, the other challenges are that, you know, how do how, how do we look to someone when we're telling you if you buy a license, it helps. Um, but that license purchase might be a challenge for some people. Um, and, and, and or, or perhaps there's just so many more uh, opportunities for people to utilize their time in other ways. Um, you know, I think the pandemic, the silver lining of it, as terrible as it was, it also showed us that connection back. And, and, and those opportunities for us to get out into the communities and find how nature helped um, those communities is important. But I don't really have, you know, um, complete answer 
because I don't think there is a it, it's it's one of those never ending questions that I think Walton presented, you know, is that um, the other quote I was going to put in there was about it's, you know, angling um, is opportunity to talk with others, but never so much that you'll ever figure it all out. Um, but I think by having these conversations and these opportunities to talk with others um, and we seek that common ground, um, maybe it isn't fishing, but maybe it's water quality or some other aspect there that really can help us um, talk and 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 but my, my, my vision is is that that fishing uh, provides a provides a start starting point maybe an icebreaker per se sorry to pardon the pun about my times on running an ice fishing creel but I learned a lot there too so I, I think just being out with the people and and conversing and and working you know with them is 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 a good first step So uh, while you're answering that previous question, uh, another one popped in my head. Does the Wildlife Resource Commission offer any like like financial support to those that may not be able to get into fishing, either the license or the equipment, to help those that may be more financially challenged get into that kind of sport if they're interested? Yeah, you know that that's a great question, Julia, and and we do have. Uh, 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 subsistence waivers um, that are available that you wouldn't necessarily need a fishing license that that is a big part of how you um, uh, um, support your protein you know as fishing is fish are, are a great source of protein and and uh, public waters are certainly there for someone to fish and catch and harvest um, and be a part of that persona that's been identified as that subsistence angler. Um, as far as equipment, um, you know, we, we offer uh, tackle loaner programs at some of those community fishing uh, sites. Um, there's other groups that uh, will work to get um, donations. Um, uh, locally here, there's the Dream uh, Hunting and Fishing Program that's uh, led by Terry Boyce, who is recently awarded um, a, a community uh, service award for, for all of his efforts and um, oftentimes he does donate uh, fishing rods and, 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 and sporting equipment, outdoor equipment to, to uh, underprivileged uh, youth and especially those that are, that are um, with a terminally ill, terminally, are terminally ill. Um, so um, yes, I, I think that we, are, we, are, we often seek those opportunities also for uh, physically challenged um, or um, individuals. We do have track chairs. I'm not sure how many people might be aware of that, but um, one day I went to Raleigh and I was come and they they told me that it was there was a track chair there and it needed to go to the Outer Banks uh, Fishing Center. So I hooked up the track chair that came with its own little tow package and I loaded up the track chair and took it to the Outer Banks. And there's there's numerous those available, and it's actually on our website um, that you can reserve that uh, for an individual that might uh, benefit from a track chair to get outdoors and again um, and and work through that. Um, we do offer, um, say, a group uh, wants to go fishing to a local area. Uh, we do have a, a, a permit um, that allows uh, a certain number of individuals to have the fishing license waived. Um, and, and to do that, but that is a permit process, but um, the opportunities are there. I think it comes back to that awareness and, you know, how can we better promote some of those uh, uh, tools and mechanisms that we do have available um, and, and what would the communities be interested in us helping with too? So very good question. We have about five more minutes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Again, you can either unmute yourself or throw it in the chat, whichever is easiest for you. Well, if nobody has any more questions, um, 
share a few opportunities around fishing with Lake Johnson. So we do loan out fishing poles at our park for free. Um, you can just show up to our waterfront center and then you'll check them out from the boathouse there. Um, you will need to bring your own bait with you. Obviously you need to abide by North Carolina fishing regulations. So having that fishing license um, and then you can fish off our boardwalk or from a boat, um, either your own personal craft, as long as it's not a motorized boat or from our rental boats. Um, and then we offer a number of programs. Um, as Kevin mentioned, we do offer, we have I think one more this summer for specifically for adults teaching you how to fish and kind of going over some of the like things you need to know about, you know, things such as weather conditions, um, licensing, stuff like that, and giving you some information as well as offering um, programs for as young as I think four, um, all the way up to family-based programs where the whole family can kind of come out and fish. Um, and I believe Lake Raleigh has a couple of um, fishing programs coming up. They also have a, um, a area called Simpkins Pond that you can um, fish from, which is a where you can fish right from the shore there. Lake Wheeler does have a daily fishing pass, so you would have to contact the office about more information for that. But for Lake Johnson, we do not um, as far as fishing opportunities within City of Raleigh. And then in North Raleigh at Drant Nature Preserve. Um, and then Wake Forest uh, at Forest Ridge Park. Um, there's also additional fishing operate opportunities if that's more where you're, where you're living in within Raleigh. I know it's a big city. <laughs> uh, well, if nobody else has any more questions for Kevin, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I will be sending out environmental lecture, uh, or not sorry, environmental educator forms later this week. Um, as well as a link to this video if you would like to rewatch it. Um, and then you'll also um, be able to go back and view past lectures. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and sharing your knowledge with us. It was very exciting to learn. Thank and you very much. I thank everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome.